Greetings, my fellow free blood summer thinkers. It's L O three is the newest podcast. My name is Craig, transmitting from the beautiful swampy mango South Florida. And today's date is Wednesday, June 6, 2018. Oh yeah, nice and warm out here. In addition, I am at Stash, which is a drinking den and coffee bar. <laughs> located at 109 Southwest 2nd Avenue, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, in the heart of the Hemji District, adjacent with Revolution and America's Backyard, run by 3J Hospitality. You figure it out. For more information about this facility, you can dial and call up 954-449-1044 or email them at info.stashftl.com. Yes, they do let me do my show here now and then, and um, it doesn't bother me one bit. Like I said, it's always been a privilege to do uh, my shows at certain locations, and I think it's really nice of them. Part of the whole community spirit, I would say. That's why I always tell folks, you know, when I see, hear people complain about their lives and how much they hate this area and so forth, what are they doing to make it better? themselves and others around them. This is just an example. It happens everywhere you go. It's never not, and, and a lot of a lot of times, it's not actually just the the location, but the person's nature. I won't say any names in good faith. There's one person wants to get the hell out of South Florida, moved up to another state, and had issues with people that had that were meth heads. Go on your way to the perfect place. Does it exist? There's no such thing as utopia. You always got to look at the pros and cons and everywhere you go. Even we have to look at ourselves in the mirror to ma- minimize our flaws and enhance our strengths. We all have. That's what being a human is all about. Each of us have great gifts and we have our falters. It's all you interesting indeed. It's funny, I was at this bar right next door here. Cool little place. One guy is talking about to the girl about he always in these crazy relationships and it looks like the person the bartender knew, knew him for like over eight years. So I start calling him I start saying, Oh, I mean entrapment man, right? And it happens to a lot of folks. If I drop a hall of synonymous would be a great organization to start. Yes, I like to I like get screwed over all the time, get trampled on by people. And, and, and when they're in the bind, I try to rescue them. And plus, I get miserable and get my drain real quick. I like being around psychic vampires. Oh, just examples. I, get, I just get a big laugh. And like I said before, we've all been swindled one way or the other, including myself. But you have to learn from it. Try to improve yourself. Make you make you make your mind a lot more complex, more intelligent. As always, um, try to be. I have my imperfections too, so that's why I never say I'm better than you. Never. Probably when we were kids, we were like pain and all the pain and that to some pe- some of the people. Made my mistakes. And hopefully one day we'll talk. If they say saying I'm a F and A hole and all that, I say yes, I admit that. I was that I was I treat you in those attributes and I do apologize. But how you do it? That's why I always tell folks, try to make yourselves better where you're at regardless. Even in the communities around you, locally. Talk to people. You know, such if you're gonna be like schlep rock, you're gonna get dismal results. You get great a lot quicker. Okay, no problem. Why is that? Yes, this is an insane world. Corruptions everywhere. Been a treacherous planet since the beginning of time. Before and before the so-called mighty dollar. You know, not so mighty when it's fiat. It's monopoly money. And uh, yeah. So, I know I'm just ranting here, but that's okay. Well, to be very frank, I remember I made a little statement on the religious liberty victory in the U.S. Supreme Court. 
that happened in Colorado with Masterpiece Baker Bakery. Of course, you got division. You got folks on both sides want to go on a high horse and all that. And some take the initiative on a, a commentary that was done by Bob Livingston. And I gotta admit, the man's very good in what he does. And uh, he's been for over at least good, almost 49 years, I would say. Gotta give him homage, man. Give him a lot of credit. I like consistency. And uh, plus, it's not strap for approved. <laughs> Associated Press, do order order approved. But uh, yeah, we'll just uh, check this out, what he has to say here. I give him my intake. It says here, a big ruling for religious liberty is a question. Not so fast. As it reads, this week the U.S. Supreme Court in favor of Masterpiece Cake Shop owner Jack Phillip, the Colorado cake baker, who was sued and sanctioned by the state of Colorado for refusing to bake a wedding cake for a sodomite wedding. That's just an opinion. That's just I'm not going to, you know, I'll continue on here. Conservative bloggers and right-leaning media hailed it as a victory for religious liberty. But was it? The court didn't rule on whether Phillips had the right to refuse to sodomize on religious grounds or on whether cake baking is protected form of free, freedom, free expression. So, no, it wasn't. It overturned the decision by the Colorado Civil Rights Commission, or CCRC that Phillips had violated the state's anti-discrimination law that bars businesses from refusing service based on race, sex, marital status, or sexual orientation and discriminate against men who want him to bake them a cake for their wedding. So, so uh, Scoutus, or, Sup or Supreme Court of the United States, determined supply that the CCRC has shown hostility to Phillips' attempt to assert his religious beliefs as a reason to deny them service. A 7-2 ruling with, with Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Justice Sonia, Sonia Sotomayor dissenting to overturn the CCRC's judgment. Scoutists determined that the CCRC didn't rule fairly or consistently when compared to its similar judgments over whether basic bakers could refuse to create cakes with anti-gay messages, according to the majority decision of the court, written by Justice Anthony Kennedy. The commission's hostility was inconsistent with the First Amendment's guarantee that our law apply in a manner that is neutral toward religion. The CCRC had not only been dismissive of Phillips' First Amendment claims, members of the commission disparaged Phillips' faith as despicable and characterized as merely rhetorical and a compare his invocation of his sincerely held religious beliefs to the defense of slavery and the Holocaust. Another indication of the hostility is different treatment of Phillips' case and the cases of other bankers with objections to anti-gay messages who prevailed before the commission. The commission ruled against Phillips in part in the theory that any message on the requested wedding cake would be attributed to the customer, not the baker. Yet the division did not address this point in any cases involving requests for cakes depicting in a gay marriage symbolism, Candy wrote. In other words, the, major the majority opinion didn't address Phillips' free speech or religious liberty argument. It simply addressed a discriminatory way in which the CCRC handled this case. This leaves the cases or others being persecuted for their religious beliefs in limbo. People like Washington Flores, Baronet Studsman, and the Mexican photographer Elaine Hodgdon. Uh, Justice Clarence Thomas, joined by Justice Neil Gor Gorish, wrote a concurrent opinion discussing the free speech issue on the case. He opened that Phillips' free exercise of religion was harmed, as was his freedom of speech. He argued that as the acceptance of gay weddings become more prevalent, the ability to speak out against it should get more protection, not less. Progressives in the anti-liberty crowd have decided that if one opens a business, he checks his own rights at the door. As such, the business owner is compelled by the state to serve anyone and everyone that the state has determined have special rights. But excluded currently, it's like Christians, Holocaust deniers, and 9-11 truthers, truthers, or those who disparage homosexual practices, as the CERC showed in his ruling. To most Americans, whether one has rights depends upon whose ox is being gored. But liberty, freedom of choice, and freedom of association are all concepts of natural law. 
the state cannot require one, one protect, protected class be granted rights without taking rights from someone else. Here we have the train coming by, so hang tight. <laughs> Sorry about that. Progressives would have you believe that allowing business owners to operate in a discriminatory fashion, which will lead to wholesale discrimination against certain cases. To prevent such wholesale discrimination, progressive creates law, not least of which is the 14th Amendment. To force businesses to operate in a manner contrary to their owners' beliefs or conscience, a clear violation of the First Amendment's free exercise and freedom of assembly causes and state loses liberty law. And you can add the ninth there as well, enumerated rights. Jim Crow is a cordial progress is a cordial cordial progressive. Love pull out the beat about the head and shoulders of liberty lovers and supporters of Lazarus fair cap fairy capitalism. But Jim Crow laws were not societal or free market constructs. Instead, they were rooted in statism and efforts by race progressives to restrict the free market from the period beginning in the early 1890s and the 1920s. In his review of David Southern's, David W. Southern's Progressive Era in Race Reform and Reaction, this is from 1900 to 1917. Reasons Damon Root wrote, the Progressive Era was also a time of vicious state-sponsored racism. In fact, from the standpoint of African American history, the Progressive Era qualifies as arguably the single worst period since emancipation. The wholesale disenfranchisement of Southern black voters occurred during these years, as did the rise and triumph of Jim Crow. Furthermore, as a Western Westminster College historian David W. Southern notes in his recent book, The Progressive Era and Race, Reform and Reactions, 1900-1917, the very worst of it, disenfranchisement, segregation, race baiting, lynching, went hand in hand with the most advanced forms of, of Southern progressivism. Progressivism, Racism was the norm, not the exception, among very crusaders romanticized by today's left activist left. So what he's trying to say is, more, same crap, different package, correct? Take the U.S. Take the Supreme Court's notorious decision in Pleasure vs. Ferguson, 1896, a case that has rightly come to symbolize the South Jim Crow regime. And let me get this one. I'll be right back. Oh, sorry about that. I had to take that call. Business. <laughs> right, I'm going to continue on here, my friends. Was there take the Supreme Court's notorious decision by Pleasant versus Ferguson, 1896? The case has has rightly come to symbolize the South Jim Crow South Jim Crow regime. In Plessy, the court considered the Louisiana statute forbidding railroads from selling first-class tickets to blacks a clear violation of economic liberty. In its 7-1 ruling, the court upheld segregation in the public accommodation so long as separate, as separate but equal facilities were provided for each race, setting off an orgy of legislation throughout the old Confederacy. South Carolina, for example, segregated two trains two years after Plessy. Streetcars followed in 1905, trade deposits in restaurants in 1906, textile plants in 1915 and 1916, Circuses in 1917, pool halls in 1924, and beaches in 1934. How nice is that, right? No doubt many of those businesses would have excluded or mistreated black customers, whatever law, but in a market free from Jim Crow regulations, or other businesses would have welcomed blacks or at least black dollars, forcing race, racist enterprises to bear the full cost of excluding or mistreating all those potential paying customers. This was one of the chief reasons of the segregationist push for those laws in the first place. The state, in the elegant words of the historian C. Van Woodward, granted free reign in the, in the majesty of law to mass aggressions that might otherwise have been curbed, blunted, or deflected. Life in a free country is about being free to make choices. Choices based on your own criteria rather than one mandated by the state. 
Don't like fried chicken? Stay at a KFC. Don't like pizza? Avoid Pizza Hut. Don't care for seafood? Rob Lobster is the only restaurant in town. Denny's gives you lousy service. Stay away and tell your friends. Don't like Walmart compensation workers? Buy, buy your cheap Chinese junk from Target or Kmart. If you can find one, order local mom and pop store and your groceries from Publix or Kroger. Don't like that chicken village present supports traditional marriage? Buy your chicken sandwich from Burger King. They've gone all uh, all in on gay pride. Don't like how Starbucks treat black customers or gun owners? Get your coffee from Joe Muggs. Don't like Muslims? Stay out of the Middle East mosque, Louis Farrakhan rallies, and U.S. prisons. And dear Boston, dear Boston, Michigan. Don't like Jews? Stay out of Israel, New York, Massachusetts, California synagogues, anywhere, and jewelry stores. Don't like kids? Avoid daycares, schools, and backgrounds, sexual and sexual intercourse, or get a job at Planned Parenthood. Don't like blacks? Move to Montana, Vermont, Ohio. There aren't many there. Don't like whites? Move to Detroit, Jackson, Mississippi, Miami Gardens, Florida, Birmingham, Alabama, Baltimore, or Memphis, Tennessee. You'll, you'll see some, but there will be a minority. That's discrimination. It's also called liberty, freedom of choice, and the concept, concept of natural law freedom of association as guaranteed in the First Amendment. What is not freedom is when states compel compels you to serve or associate with or accommodate those who you don't want to, regardless of the reason. That's called slavery and tyranny. What he's stating when he got these governmental laws telling us how to dictate in those areas without harming others, those, those particular free choices, And it becomes a burden on your natural born rights. See, I can associate wherever I want. And there's a lot of people I talk to, doesn't matter what they look at, where they come from. Articulate individuals. I support ethics. I go by their actions, nothing else. There's a beautiful people, all walks of life around the world. A person like myself from Brooklyn, New York, I see some good folks, some bad folks, doesn't matter. Even down here. Live in South Florida for 41 years. I do recall the Haitian, Cuban, Nicaraguan exoduses. And of course, all the northerners coming down here as well. Are they all bad folks? Absolutely not. Are they all criminals? Hell no. The folks that come from third world nations do not, do not rely on the government to take care of them. I have a good friend of mine from Honduras. Her whole family came from over there. It was a real troubled nation. And they didn't, they didn't support government handouts. They earned their merits and became citizens. Doesn't matter what they look like. I give them homage. Ethics. Not ethnics. And this is not, even with some of the actions here, I'm going to tell folks, I may not agree with the homosexual practices, lesbian practices. I may not. That's my, that's my view. However, I'm not going to condemn them. I treat them as individuals and nothing else. No special... No special entitlements. Period. Regardless. That's how I get along with folks. Even in this community and everywhere I went. I treat them as individuals. And it was interesting about this because even the Colorado, the CCRC, you got a train coming by again. I love that sound. Sounds real sexy, right? Absolutely. So just hang tight here for a moment. I try to see how much more I can get. But, um, one moment. <laughs> I'm about to find a little location for you. That's a bright light. Cool. So, what the CCRC's big mistake was is it was not just not religious liberty, it's their natural born rights and they need to start reading their own state constitution I have talked about this before and we can look at chapter 2 section 3 which is Bill of Rights by the way the state constitution and it reads here on the nail rights all persons have certain natural essential nail rights among which may be reckoned the right of enjoying and defending the lives and liberty of acquiring possession and protecting property and of seeking and obtaining their safety and happiness. So the problem is with that town and the CCRC breached 
that particular law. When we can go down to the 11 ex post facto laws, no ex post facto law, nor law impairing the obligation of contracts or retrospectiveness operation or making any irrevocable grant of special privileges, franchises, or immunities shall be passed by the General Assembly. So what they're saying is that that one particular law which Mr. Livingston talked about, and even in the courts, is considered a post, is an ex, ex post facto law. Definitely breaching Article 2, Section 11. And we could hit 28 as well under enumerated rights. And as, as it reads here, it's almost equivalent to the Ninth Amendment U.S. Constitution. Rights reserved, not disbarred. The enumeration in this constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny, impair, or disparage others retained by the people. All right? So in that, in one of the areas I question is the Section 30B. They say no protected status based on homosexual, lesbian, or bisexual orientation. It says neither the state of Colorado, though, of any of its branches or departments, nor in its agencies, political subdivision, municipality, or the district, shall enact, adopt, or enforce any statute, regulation, or ordinance, or policy whereby homosexual, lesbian, or bisexual orientation, conduct, practices, or relationships shall constitute or otherwise be the basis of entitled any person or class of persons to have, claim, have or claim any minority status, quota, preferences, protected status, and claim of discrimination. The section of the Constitution shall be in all respects self executing. So that particular law about business can contradict 30B. Uh, however, like I said, it's a little touchy there because, like I said before, the homosexual, lesbian, and bisexual orientation are considered indivi rights of individuals, if, regardless if you agree with the practice or not. And, and the question I have on that, that can contradict their inalienable rights under 328. And I can, I can say this in good faith. It can, you can probably question this. Does it violate the ex post facto law under, under Article 2, Section 11 of the state constitution? Something is good to look at and think about. It doesn't matter who you are. Because when you know these things, it could prevent a lot of BS, tyranny, and all that. That's why... Even in the great state of Florida, I tell all my f fellow friends in here who are registered voters to read your state constitution because a lot of stuff is happening are being violated under the supreme law of our state. Like oh, here in Colorado, it's just a very good example. People got, they should have went to their state constitution. You got people, these politicians need to read their state constitution before jumping the gun. And I don't care... Um, if they're a lawyer, they know more than you. I laugh at these people. Oh, well, well, I'm a lawyer. I told them, you really suck at it. Now you got the technology. Use it. Utilize it. And share with others. Knowledge is power. And ignorance is enslavement. Blatant ignorance as well. Cool. So, next thing we're going to hit here came from the government riot came out yesterday. It's an educational alternative news source. And it's by Jack Mullen. He's a contributing writer for government rag. And then uh, I can thank uh, Popeye from Down the Rabbit Hole, federaljack.com, uh, that brought this out. I've been following them for a good period of time. It says here, Hack Minds Mobilized to Sarm Americans. And this is what he has to say. It came out yesterday. I like to quote her. The exact contrary of what is generally believed is often truth. John de la Barre, 1645 to 1696. If we understand the mechanisms and motives of the group mind, it is now possible to control and regiment the masses according to what our will without their knowing it. Everybody's propaganda. Great book. You gotta read this. It's fantastic. Cultural Marxism is now called political correctness. It's a loaded gun that one puts to their own head. The narrative illusion normalizes the abnormal, and it is an elitist weapon over minions for citizen versus citizen, policing for establishment control, information warfare. The Mimi is the embryo of the narrative. James Scott. 
we are nearing the end of American experience as we know it now. And I will continue on here. Societal forces, including insidious infiltrations of anti civilization, secret societies to Masons, banning birth, also Freemasonry, oh, yeah. the Knights Templar Masons, Jesuits related to Freemasonry, Mercurians of Masonic, and, and many others, along with their multitude of sub orders and this conditioning of the masses via propaganda and emotional hijacking of thought with subsequent insertion of vi a viral and weaponized memes have nearly destroyed the pillars and the foundation of American culture and civilization. The recent fake shootings at Sandy Hook, Parkland, Florida nightclub, Las Vegas, and now Santa Fe are being used to generate armies of proper program civil civilization destroyers, people whose minds have been hacked and thoughts like computer code inserted. First and foremost, the profound weapon a nation of special interest can possess is control over information. Its contribution to control over the narrative and the Mimi is the embryo of the narrative. Information warfare begins and ends with the Mimi, IBID. One such group is a subsur subversive communist political front organization created by Zionist billionaire Michael Bloomberg called Every Town for Gun Safety. And just to let you folks know, Michael Bloomberg is a member of the Council of Foreign Relations. Another bend over Bob to the New World Order, a pretentious corrupt gino, which it means a Jew name only, not being anti Semitic. The title is a BB designed to, to deceive, conveying a sense of community approval, bundled with the easy to understand and accept for gun safety. Really, who is not for gun safety? This group presents itself as being con concerned with safe gun use, but actually works obsessively toward removal of gun rights of Americans who own a gun at all, and ultimately disarming all Americans through escalation of gun removal tactics, placing all Americans in legal categories that are denied gun use. No. The reason for trying to disarm Americans can be seen in the result of disarmament in the Soviet Union before tens of millions were murdered by communists. The flip side of the Talmudic political system, Zionism, Lenin, Trotsky, and Stalin, also or present day South Africans who were disarmed after the communist African National Congress took control of the South African government and now face genocide. And you can say that happened with the apartheid too, with the blacks as well. So let's debate that fair. To facilitate the Zionist organization goals called Every Town, subgroups are organized using psychological operations tailored to the targeted minds, tactics used to collect actors, members involved, emotion and thought misdirection. The careful use of weaponized memes targeting vulnerables and weak minds. One such group is Moms, Moms Get the Mind Action, an organization funded by Bloomberg via Every Town. No, Bloomberg alone has spent dozens of millions in the past decade to destabilize America, change in the American form of government, including taking down the Constitution, spending which include funding of political left candidates, and more recently, millions spent by on behalf of every town. And I dare call this treasonous. Prove me wrong if you dare. In all, every, every town spent $12.1 million on the 2014 election ballots, including Washington ballots and initiatives and legislative contests. In states such as Colorado and Oregon, for spokeswoman Erica Soto Lamb. It is part of a $50 million election year commitment Bloomberg made to gun violence prevention, USTA Today. So you're being bribed. Okay, folks? You're being blackmailed, bribed, and bamboozled. Working with vulnerable minds and highly advanced costs, no objection, weaponized mind propaganda. Which package? Packages general, generalized deception. This organization animates foot soldiers that carry out the plans and operations of the primary subversive political group. The mind is the new war space and the Mimi is both subliminal and hand grenade and the new nuclear weapon. Psychographic targeting renders the experience of parasitically embedding the Mimi within the vast labyrinth of abstract. Your ideas are bound to are bound to forces of which you have no control due to the fact you voluntarily submitted your freedom of thought to the perception steering censorship of dragged surveillance capitalists. 
First and foremost, the most profound weapon a nation of special interest can possess is control over information. This contributes to the control narrative. Me, uh, narrative and the Mimi is the emperor of the narrative. Information warfare begins and ends with the Mimi to the mind. To the mind. Psycho, psych, psychographic targeting is easy made via big data analytics. The treasure trove of rarely available metadata curated by dragnet surveillance capitalists and a legislative body that lacks the understanding of the dangers of its weaponization data layered with the weaponization of their of other digital vectors such as search engine results social media banner placement blogs and bots infused with machine learning and artificial intelligence can introduce mutate and expand memes and conversations out of the thin air that can instantaneously become part of the mainstream narrative information warfare james scott the video below is a, is a powerful example of how carefully chosen and lying psychological operatives are employed to promote organizations like moms and man action to weak and vulnerable minds minds who have been who have already been pre-softened by trauma and violence based theater of the mind attacks which do not need real violence only simulate real violence and this video is a fake shoot um, school shooting stage already closed and abandoned school building in Newtown Connecticut closed after years earlier which it provided a psychological opening through trauma hook elementary school shooting. because these vulnerable people are already predisposed to accept the words of perceived authorities without dependent thought or research, they are already receptive of being potential carriers of the virulent and civilization destroying memes. So the video here says caution the video uses live active memes to modify your think pro thinking process. Please view with critical thinking as a firewall to these dangerous memes. So it's a form of mind control we're talking about. What's interesting about when we talk about Newtown. Because the question I have, see, see, the problem is, when they, when they try to throw some, oh, well, you, you believe the Sandy Hook thing was a fake and nothing is a, is a fake, it never happened, this and that, I would recommend this. The question I would ask and have the documentation ready to go, based according to FBI.gov under Uniform Crime Reporting in 2012, Tablet 8 under Connecticut. Explain why Newtown was report have reported zero murders in 2012, and according to them, Sandy Hook happened around December before winter recess, December of 2012. You can I po I talked about this many times. I had links on it. It's not difficult to find. I remember Infowars brought it out, talked about it, so I verified it, and they were correct. That was a memorable article. Ask any of these people in Congress with those documentations in your hand. Explain to me why there were zero murders documented under the FBI reports. UCR. Especially the federal um, representatives. That's a legitimate question. Have that in your hand and, sh and put that on camera and see how they react. Then you got it. Just to make you guys think. That's how you talk about. That's what about information warfare is all about. And ways of countering it. And I will continue on here. Only work remaining for mom demand, mom demand action. Psychological operation. Is to tap into already hacked consciousness. Hooking the vulnerable false trauma based violence wound of a fake school shooting. And deliver the package of Mimi laden emotional charge, pre charge presentations. After which certain percentage of the effect. It will drop what they are doing and download a package of BBs and fall in line to begin the work are being programmed to do. In this case, the hack mind warriors have been programmed to be activists, agitated legislators, and government biases are Americans. These attitudes will also dump prioritizing their implanted memes in much the same way a virus will generate and shed itself after affecting the a host, further infecting other minds. In the video above, we are immediately brought back to the traumatizing memories of a fake Sandy Hook shooting with the narrator, Erica Lafferty, Lef 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 explains her mom was killed at Sandy Hook School. 
from there, the viewer is subject to a sappy, sad music, crying people, and word like slaughtered and terrifying. These words used for trauma-based mind control programming. It's very dangerous use of occult technology, which have been used repeatedly over centuries, have been recently improved in the school's modern psychological warfare for the purpose of causing civilization change. Fear is the greatest weapon. Any questions, my friends? Study the after post 9-11 programs. September 11, 2001 is a fantastic example of using fear as a great weapon. Infowars and PSYOPs were, I mean, PSYOP games have been transformed and we are no longer dropping lethals from helicopters of Vietnam saying America is your friend. This is now a battle to defend the psychological core of the population in order to save this fledging democracy. Information war, warfare, James Scott. That's his quote. Because the, of the internet and its ability to quickly reach millions of people, the dangers of sophisticated techniques of manipulation and mass mind control are more dangerous now than any other time in history. Large populations of Americans have been primed for use as Mimi actors and Mimi sh um, shedders, with the mainstream media completely under control of the me enemy of America. The media has been precisely tuned as a trusted client with unrestricted, no firewall, access to human central nervous system process unit, the mind and brain. And to make matter, matters worse, Americans have been taught since birth to respect, trust, and validity and affordable critical thinking skills which presented with information by trusted authorities. Well, you know how you count that? Read the Declaration of Independence. Almost the last couple paragraphs. Self-explanatory. We have voluntarily agreed to let invisible governments sift the data in the high spot, the outstanding issues, so that our field of choice shall be narrowed to practical proportions from our leaders and the media they use to reach the public. We accept the evidence and the decrim ooh, de demarcation of issues bearing upon public questions. Some ethical teacher, be it a minister, a favorite essayist, or merely prevailing opinion, we accept the standardized code of social conduct to which we conform most of the time. Everybody's quote propaganda. Information control by clever manipulation. People can be led to believe something that is not true. Such information is carefully timed and presented by an accepted and respected authority. Information is processed by the brain in a very specific way. At the base of the brain, there is check valve called the reticular activating system that screens information. What seems to happen is this. When the information is introduced, it is compared with previously acquired information and that cat and then cataloged. When the information is required and is retrieved and brought into conscious awareness according to the need. Now, if there is no file for the piece of information, a file is is begun and added to when related information is acquired. If you accept the information as true, it is cataloged that way. If you reject the information as false, it is cataloged that way. However, if you don't know the information is true or not, your trust in the source of information determines whether or not you accept it, even if you're not sure or don't understand it. Secret knowledge is the basis of all power. Your source information depends upon you who are in the what same position you hold in society. Your source information, source of information determines the reliability of what you know, what you know, uh, and the reliability of what you know determines everything that happens to you. And information can be controlled. Words can inform or misinform. What people think can be controlled by controlling information. That was from Mind Control United States by Stephen Jacobson. This programming has primed many Americans as candidates for greater roles in the continuing movements to change the American political system and to take down the present paradigm of civilization. These program individuals think, think according to an idea of hive mind rather than individuals escalate, um, evaluators of data and information, leaving the heavy lifting to others and selecting the group which re represents their feelings regarding the first impressions made about any issue or topic of importance. And this was um, one quote here. Groupthink is mode of thinking that people engage and win concurs. 
concurrent, seek, seeking become so dominant in a cohesive and group that it overrides realistic appraisals of alternate courses of action. It is a vital to maintain maintaining an already collected and controlled population. One, if if one has a control over all things of information, such as group, such as books, media, and the web, then a cohesive group co consciousness is all that remains. Information warfare by James Scott. So he put a lot of quotes in this art in his article, which is good. It keeps you, you know, say he's not alone in this fight. For these bombs, the abundance of evidence and proof beyond a reasonable doubt, available to understand how and why Sandy Hook school shooting was fake does not matter. Further, it does not matter to these moms, the consequences of their children. It turns out the shooting was fake. If the school, if these school shootings are fake, Sandy Hook and beyond, the implications is these moms are being used as zombie servants for the agenda, for an agenda, has no empathy and no concern for the damage it does by subjecting children and their parents to trauma and mental abuse of fake school shooting. The few further these moms, if they could think would then realize this agenda is so evil it will be just a matter of simple induction to deduce the plan on hurting everyone after they remove the tools of self-defense from the people leave them defenseless against whatever may come and those other school shootings okay regardless of their false flags or not they all occurred in firearm free zones or fake shoes and all that. They all occurred in firearm free zones. So you have to look at those areas too. And I don't jump the gun that every school shooting is uh, total theatrical and all that because um, people have, these good folks have died in these shootings. And many of these individuals are on psychotropic drugs. And you, you, some, some people may be involved, but it could be, could be patsies. You have to look at all those errors. That's why I told my friends out there, how deep does the rabbit hole go? But I will continue on. For those who might want to join the other side, that is, th those of us on the side of critical thinking and reasoning, those of us seeing reality, I offer these resources for learning what really happened in Sandy Hook. From this, take this information and educate others before it is way too late. And this is right here. The book, Nobody Died at Sandy Hook, edited by Dr. James H. Fetzer, with contributions of 13, contributions of 13 contributors, including six current or retired PhD professors who have established through their research the school have been abandoned by 2008. Signatures available by Moon Rock Books, where there is a short, shorter first version available. Free download here, Nobody Died at Sandy Hook. And you can download it and make your own judgment. As a video in, in introduction, detailed and discussion of high school shootings, this video is among the best. There's a link for that. I'm going to take initiative on checking it out myself. Observe responsibly, to be exact. Okay, so don't worry. Just, like I said, always observe responsibly. The primary issue facing Americans is the law of nature. It's a universal axiom. People are safer when they can defend themselves against any possible harm. You are safer if you have a tourniquet at home after a terrible cut. Then you are waiting for an ambulance to come and stop the bleeding. It is a law of nature that be making third, party respon third parties responsible for your safety and well-being will in unacceptable outcomes. People must take their own well-being before they can divide their time for the well-being of other of another. And you should you should always look up sovereign immunity tort liability in your state and territories of the United States, even Canada too. You can look that up. So I posted that stuff so many times, and um, uh, you can just uh, yeah. You can, a lot of my listeners know what to do. <laughs> All right. It says here, in the case of emergency, there will always be a hierarchy of choices made before the next person can be served. In the case of self-protection against violent attack, being able to defend yourself has the highest probability of survival. Further, it could be shown in my article there is no such thing as a gun-free zone. That people are overall safer in the presence of expanding populations of people who can take care of themselves. And no one here, the gun agenda today is not about safer gun use, but rather disarming Americans. Being disarmed forces people in the state of having the lowest probability of survival when facing violent attacks and at least the people the choices facing the pro uh, violent provocation of authoritarian demands. When everyone is armed, a person, a group, or gang, or even an army attempting violence against people has less probability of being successful. Adversity, proportion 
to the number of people armed in nearby simple logic. An armed size of polite society and armed people are not easily susceptible to mass humiliation or extermination. And we can look at a couple things like when they had no guns for Negroes, like the, like a lot of blacks, a lot of states, including northern states, wouldn't allow a person to own a farm because of their background, African American background. And of course, we can look at this armament of um, wounded knee. All right, and uh, and the counter to that, we should look up the Battle of Athens, Tennessee, where it was over vote fraud when the GI. Um, Bunch, a bunch of um, supporters of the, of the GI party got together and challenged the sheriff and won. Okay? Look at Battle of Athens, Tennessee. So that's why you gotta look at all sides. Just remember, my friends, the past is today's greatest teacher. And we can even look what happened at the Bundy Ranch, too. We had armed individuals and the, and the federal agents backed off really quick. Therefore, we only have one conclusion to draw regarding the motivations of those attempting to arm Americans. It is not about making people safer. It's about making violent aggressors safer. The time has come for those who can think to understand this war against constitutional European culture, loving Americans, and the enemy is winning. Winning because there are so many subversive groups like simultaneously both external and visible like every town and any American organization like the SPLC, which is the Southern Poly Law Center, one of my favorite crap groups, I can say that. And Morris Tees is makes Benedict Arnold an honorable patriot. Pretend to be protecting the rights while others working internally, including deeply embedded secret societies of oath and of loyalty. They require service to the agenda of the secret society above all loyalties and nation states. It is no accident. This arm America agenda and the memes of their zombie army are focused on so called assault rifles, in particular the AR 15. This weapon, however, is involved in statistically significant cases of homicide by firearm. This should be telling because the AR 15 is one of the best tools people can use to defend themselves against an organized violent attack, say from America, say from their government or hostile invading forces. Keep this chart in mind. In AR, AR-15 circulation, 15 million. Homicide by rifles, 252. Homicide by AR-15s, max average five years, point, 0.1. Rif- hom- rifles used in homicides, 3%. AR-15s used in homicides, 0.4%. Remember, they don't want you to know that. Ain't the truth? Does the truth hurts, my friends? So, just with 15 million AR-15s and 100 rounds of ammo per operator, Americans could resist an army of millions of soldiers. If the controls of the American people were planned to dis- to harm the citizens of the United States, this arming people will be will be clearly be the one of the first signs. Very good example. When Chen Hai Ken Hai Shek disarmed the Chinese in nineteen thirty five. That's before Mao Tse Sung, by the way. Nationalist China, nineteen thirty five. And what happened two years a couple years later? Japan invaded China. Why? Because the people were disarmed. Ain't that nice? Study your history, my friends, and of course some of the towns were slaughtered, murdered, raped, and pillaged. They had their own Holocaust in some of those towns, and unfortunately, I don't have, I don't know one of those, uh, some of those cities and villages that happened, but it did occur under the Empire of Japan. Just an example. And there's, and there's even claims too of child actors, former crisis actors, and there's one video, and there's plenty of other articles to check out. And one thing I say, my friends, the truth. Hurts. The truth hurts, so stay vigilant. And that's why I'm always one of those individuals I would love to see. See, when people learn the facts. But one thing I tell everyone here, my friends, you never, ever trust the government. In a genocidal um, of the 20th century, they say 170 million people were slaughtered. Okay? You can look it up. Innocence Betrayed is a great video. You go to archive.org or over to jpfo.org. 
and of course death by government by the late R.J. Rummel. And there's even other times too that 260 million people were slaughtered with a victim of democide because of victim disarmament. It doesn't benefit anyone but the state and their cronies and anyone that supports it are nothing more than enemies of freedom, natural law. They're absolutely treasonous. Even the moms demand action think you do to, for your children's sake could. Well, I know one thing for sure. Go back in your faces. Mark my words. The past is today's greatest teacher. And all those other Pamala out there. I don't give a damn what you think. I'm a na- I'm a natural born person. I'm not a, da- not a damn thing you can do about it. Day two. I don't want to play that, huh? Teasers. But um, <laughs> I'll try to try wing it here. Sorry about that. Yeah, you know how that goes. Gotta uh, take care of a few things here, but yeah, you know, just uh, okay. Well, I lied. I'm gonna continue on. Just this confounded delays. Come on. Yeah. So sometimes, sometimes the internet you have these slow uh, actions now and then. I, I get mad, but it's not even worth my energy. Hang tight with me for a moment. One of those little glitches, I would say. You know what? I'm going to play some music here. That's the way I can do this. And I'll do a little Age of Raisin by Cosmo Gyro. will be right back. Let thy heart acknowledge coming to you, to thy knowledge. 
Yeah, that was Age Reason by Cosmo Gyro off their new album, Behold. Check it out. And um, just look up CosmoGyroOfficial.com. And I'm sorry for those technical difficulties. I had to wing it there. But, hey, like the song, share it with others, buy the album, download it, all that good stuff. They got an iTunes, Amazon, and all, this, all, of, all of those. And remember, the good thing about it, they're independent to the core. No, no um, controlled record label or anything like that. If you haven't heard the interview I did with uh, Sean Adams and Dee Mulligan from the band, you go. You can go to my to to, to the to the, sh- to, the, to the shows I did put it on my on my archives and look and look through podcast. Originally came from you fought my new show called Euphonic Parasology. So hey, check it out and you won't be disappointed. And I thank you in advance. All right, finally, this one actually came out from uh, the end of AmericanDream.com by Michael Snyder, who is running for a dis- the district house, rep- running for the house in Idaho on the federal level. I think it's District 1 or 2. I could be mistaken, but he's, um, he, he's a very uh, intelligent man. And I should always like, hey, just give him a listen, read his stuff. And observe responsibility because he does you know, have a lot of facts. And it says here, and the worst city in America for 2018 is, came out yesterday. It says here, before I reveal the city which was chosen the worst city in America this year, let me give you some hints. At one time, nearly 2 million people lived there, but now the population has declined to 700,000. It was one of the greatest manufacturing cities in the entire world, and it was boasted the highest per capita income in the whole country 50 years ago thriving middle class neighborhoods prepared peppered the city but today has become a Ryan decaying nightmare in the poster child of urban decay tens of thousands of abandoned buildings and I will just read it from here and so you probably already guessed by now that the city I'm talking about is Detroit so precisely how Detroit was selected the worst city in America this year. Well, 24-7, Wall Street has developed an index that factor eight, eight different categories. 24-7, Wall Street created an index which measures eight categories, crime, economy, education, environment, health, housing, infrastructure, and leisure to identify the 50 worst cities to live in. Not confined to a, to a single region the worst city spanned the country from the south to the midwest and from New England to the Pacific Coast. After considering all those factors, 24-7 Wall Street determined that Detroit really is the country's worst city to live in. Detroit, Michigan holds a dubious title of being the country's worst city to live in, according to a new report ranking America's 50 most unappealing places to call home. Detroit has just the right combination of poverty and unemployment, crime, and other factors to hold its first place position, followed by Flint, Michigan, and St. Louis, Missouri. And Flint, Michigan has been an issue for a very long time as well. The ironic thing is that Detroit has actually been bouncing back a little bit in recent years. The city has become a magnet for millennials that are attracted by the 
Bergonian tech startup and emerging hipster culture. But even though things might might not be quite as bad as they were a few years ago, 24-7 Wall Street still says no other major city in America is worse. The post child of America post-industrial urban decline, Detroit, Michigan, ranks the worst city in the country to live in. Once to 1.8 million residents at the peak of U.S. auto manufacturing in the 1950s, the city is now home to fewer than 700,000 after decades of decline. A poor, economically depressed city, more than one in every three Detroit residents live below the poverty level line. The city has now once the highest unemployment rates in the United States, with 10.9% of the workforce out of a job. Detroit is also dangerous, along with Las Vegas. It is one of the only cities nationwide that there were over 2,000 violent crimes for every 100,000 residents in 2016. Of course, there are a lot of people that live and work in Detroit that would disagree. A local newspaper interviewed some of them about this new ranking, and I found a quote from a woman named Margaret Corky to be particularly revealing. Detroit is a beautiful place to live in. I mean, we have our problems, granted. But there are beautiful architecture like your old, like you know, old English village, Palmer Woods, the riverfront, all these new restaurants here were coming back. Yet we have problems, I'll give it to you. But I love Detroit, I don't live, I don't live in Detroit anymore, but I used to, but still my, my, um, still is, still is my heart. So let's get this straight. She's trying to tell us how wonderful Detroit is, but she doesn't live there anymore. It's a question, right? In life, what people do is far more important than what they say. And what would be very interesting to know, why she made a decision to get out of there. Of course, why shouldn't we shouldn't just pick on Detroit? There are many other formerly great U.S. cities in much, happy, in much better days. Just check out the other major cities fall in the top ten. Number one, Detroit, Michigan. Number two, Flint, Michigan. Number three, St. Louis, Missouri. Number four, Las Vegas, Nevada. Number five, Memphis, Tennessee. Number six, Cleveland, Ohio. Number seven, Wilmington, Delaware. Number eight, Albany, Georgia. Number nine, Springfield, Missouri. And number ten, Baltimore, Maryland. Just the ten, but there's many others as well. I was more than a little surprised to see Las Vegas make the list. The Las Vegas economy has been doing quite well over the past few years, but it made a list because of extremely high crime rate. Springfield, Missouri should definitely be on this list. I've been to Springfield a number of times, and it's not a bad area, but 24-7 Wall Street included it on the list because of an elevated crime rate and because about one of every four residents is living in poverty. And I have to say that it was quite astounding sounded that Baltimore only made it to number 10 on the list. I've been to Baltimore many, many times. It should be definitely be closer to the top. It is right in decaying war zone. And there are certain parts of Baltimore that are bad or worse than anything that Detroit has to offer. Other cities I would have to put much closer to the top of the list include Chicago, Oakland, and Stockton. And of course, the whole... A whole, a whole host, a whole, whole, a whole host of Rodney cities in the Rust Belt have been experiencing what Detroit is going through on a smaller scale. We live in a time when virtually our entire nation is in a decline. We are decaying economically, morally, mentally, emotionally, and physically. At one time, our society was an envy of the rest of the world, but the rest of the world just talks about how great we used to be. The only way we, got, we, are, we have been able to maintain our greatness in recent years is by ongoing into unprecedented amounts of debt. Our current debt-fueled standard of living is not even close to sustainable, and, and once this current bubble implodes, we're going to see America's decline go to an entirely new level. It's interesting, too, when you have the, the private central banks, these, all these saving loan scandals, and even um, uh, neo-mercantilism kills a lot of cities as well and this, I'm not saying not to the small rust belts but to a lot of other cities like Detroit Chicago and all those other areas let's give you an example crime was always going to be an issue and sometimes they may use the school shoot the music that mass shootings that happened there brought the crime rate up that's possible too that you could add that to the mix one of the areas people need to, need to really look at we got to focus on our necessities. We can't use our luxuries as our necessities. We can't be using our credit cards 
depend depend on everything. Be loaned, be be enslaved. That's a form. That's a, that's one thing Alexander Hamilton was. He was a financial slave master, according to the book Hamilton's Curse, written by James De Lorenzo. And he has plenty of other footnotes and, and bibliographies and all that to uh, pull, uh, to uh, back up his views. And it's very disturbing too. This is why we have to start. Like there's some beautiful people that live, still live in Detroit. They want to see things better. So if things gonna happen. It may not be the same, but things can make it can be better. It's gonna take some time. We gotta look at ourselves. We gotta let. We gotta start having the states produce their own money with gold and silver, guaranteed under Article One, Section Ten of the U.S. Constitution. The Federal Reserve and these big corporate banks are parasites. And of course, you could thank globalism, such as NAFTA and GATT, and governments telling these businesses, you gotta, you gotta, we're going to punish you for being productive. And don't get me wrong, I support working, living condi- working conditions and all that as well. And the taxaholics in some of those big cities. But not all, just to just give you some examples. You always have those hick towns too. Small communities are very poor. Very depleted. I give you one, Gibsonton, which is um, near the Tampa Bay area. It, and this would be like, we call it Carney Town. Now, the areas in there is very blighted and it's, it's very disturbing. So it's happening everywhere. And we got to start looking at ourselves, focus on our communities, not depend on the central banks or government. Do everything, they should work for us. Not the other way around. Those are the areas I say I question in good faith. The support, let's bring back the markets, open free market society. It's not going to happen overnight, but it can be achieved. That's what I mean by not cronyism, but open free market from the capitalism. Big difference. Anyone, anyone to question that? Read about it before making any comments. And that is it. I thank everyone for listening. Plus, feel free to download and share us throughout your social media networks. If you have any questions, comments, or you're sending something that's interesting, you may want to check out. Whatever you do, please address your correspondence with the corner. You can hit me on Facebook, Twitter, Google Plus, Breaker, Our Heart Radio, Tumblr, YouTube, Freedoms Network. Give them a hand because they are. Um, having issues if they if they don't get enough funds that particular social media site will be extinct minds.com futurenet.club patreon.com for slash look and look three or three eyes if you want to be a donor that'd be nice you could be a gab g-a-b dot a-i which is more of a free fear speech version of twitter you get me on yours.org and oneway.org now I'm hitting other alternative video sites as well, so uh, just uh, let you folks know. And you can hit me at buddylist.co too. In addition, you can email me at lookandluck3 at gmail.com or to you cryptic ones, especially with the Proton Mail account. Lookyluck numbers 03 at protonmail.com. Well, my friends, as all for now, once again, thank you for your time. Plus, always remember that the demoniac resistance is healthy for the soul and can liberate humanity. Until next time, take care of yourselves. Keep on spreading love, and may your guardian spirits be with you.